A Forest Imbalance is brought to you by the Mississippi Forestry Commission, the Southern Group of State Foresters, and the USDA Forest Service. This is a forest in balance. There's plenty of suitable habitat. Habitat for animals to walk through. Habitat for birds to fly through. There's enough sunshine and rain for plants to grow and enough of other natural processes to keep pests in check. Clear out dangerous underbrush to keep a balance in nature. Natural processes like fire. It's fascinating. It's like the difference. Why is it so different? How does fire function in the environment? How is, uh, is this possible? Is this good? Is this bad? You know, uh, I'm, I'm curious. It makes me want to know more about it. It's taken a long time for me to fully appreciate the role of fire and, and I enjoy teaching people because it's not a simple concept to get across to people. It, it takes some time and some demonstration and explaining to get them to understand what it's all about. Just about any kind of ecology you do in the South uh, is, has to do with fire because so many of the different habitat types are fire dependent. So it's almost hard to get around uh, being a fire ecologist if you do ecology in the South. For years, we were told any forest fire was a bad thing, and that was wrong. There is an entire profession of conservationists and scientists who study the natural processes of fire. These fire ecologists don't just book study, they regularly go out into the field and see for themselves firsthand how important the natural process is to maintain a healthy ecosystem. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. Eric Stoller is a resource coordinator and land manager with a master's degree in wildlife biology. Dr. Kevin Robertson is a fire ecology research scientist who began his career in the Florida Everglades. Dr. Ron Masters has more than 30 years experience in forest wildlife management and research. Caroline Noble is a fire ecologist with a master's degree in forestry who started her career as a hotshot fighting fires out west. Lane Green has been using, managing, and promoting the use of prescribed fire for more than 50 years. Together, they have a vast experience studying forests across the United States. This is an upland pine ecosystem. Widely spaced pines with few understory shrubs and a dense ground cover of grasses and herbs. Upland pine forests that are managed with fire are home to a huge diversity of plant and animal life. These uh, southeastern grasslands maintained with fire, it's not uncommon to have three or four hundred different species of plants to learn in a, a single hilltop, so that keeps us pretty busy. The southern mixed pine hardwood forest encompasses all of the southern states. Hardwood forest elements naturally occur within this area, and some are fire dependent. Fire is a dominant and necessary factor here. Well, it's a natural process. Uh, uh, it's just as important as sunshine, rain, and wind uh, to all the uh, many species that depend upon fire for their very survival. So they got to have uh, uh, rain to grow habitat and, and wind move seeds around to plant them, sunshine, the energy to grow fire recycling process that makes all of that work. Without fire, Longleaf pine seedlings cannot establish, and oaks and other hardwoods become more numerous. These fires used to occur naturally every one to seven years. Lightning strikes originally started fires. A, a strike of a tall tree that's well grounded in the forest scatters sparks across the forest floor, and then flames would ignite. Say there was a wind blowing this direction, the fire would start in that direction, the wind changed, it would move around. So it, it, it did what we call meandered across the landscape. And it was uh, uh, almost as if it was alive. 
these fires used to slowly spread over considerable distance until they hit a stream or other gap in vegetation. Roads in development create artificial fire breaks, ending the natural meandering and stopping the natural progression of fire. So before there was that road there, it would have continued on uh, uh, maybe for several weeks. And these are low intensity fires, just constantly moving back and forth through the forest. The thick bark of longleaf pines protects adult trees from fire damage. Even seedling trees, with their buds protected by a thick mass of needles, survive frequent light surface fires. And one of the things that the uh, Native Americans noticed is that after a fire, the grazing animals showed up. Well, they depended on those animals for food, for shelter, uh, for hides and other things. Uh, and so they said, ah, we set the fire, we can bring the, the, uh, these animals in. They also, it kept uh, areas cleared around their villages. They could pass through the woods more easily. They learned it from observation of nature. We learned it from them, and we've continued that tradition for people that lived on the land. Somebody who doesn't live on the land, that's where uh, we have to get them to understand this is a natural process. Very difficult concept because uh, fire is scary. Fire you see in the headlines is something to be uh, afraid of and prevented. The story of the good side of fire as a natural process is still being told. New research suggests that natural fire frequency is also good for soil nutrients, carbon storage, and improved watershed function. The differences between land that is burned regularly and land that is denied fire is striking. This area is interesting because it's been burned annually for a number of years. What's significant about it is the fact that it was actually burned four months ago. And as a result, you can see that we have this lush growth that has come up. A variety of grasses, a variety of forbs, which are herbaceous plants, which people often call weeds. These plants are important because they provide foods for a number of wildlife species. And it happens because of the frequent fire. The frequent fire removes the litter, it removes the mulching effect, and it allows uh, free space, free from competition for plants to grow. The diversity out here is wonderful for plants, and the diversity is also wonderful for wildlife. The area we're in now is burned on a two-year cycle, and has been burned on a two-year cycle for a number of years. It's interesting to note that that changes things uh, a lot uh, in terms of the plant community that's found here. We have our herbs and forbs, our grasses, but we also have woody structure here from the hardwood plants and occasional pine seedling that uh, have sprouted. These species form a different kind of structure which are associated with different species of wildlife. For example, the Bachman sparrow. It's a sparrow found throughout the southeastern states and one of these fire dependent species that we talk a lot about is, is playing a key role in uh, why we need to burn uh, the pine woods of the southeast. Jim Cox is an ornithologist with over 25 years experience in research on birds of the southern pine ecosystem. But this bird is so dependent on fire that um, if you don't burn an area, it starts to disappear within uh, 18 months after the last time a fire goes through. It spends all of its time foraging on the ground, so it needs open conditions at ground level. And once the grasses and everything has grown back to the point that it's so thick at ground level, usually about 18 months of a fire, this bird starts to leave the areas and disappears. It's one of those fire dependent species that uh, is declining throughout the southeast right now. It likes the woody perches to do its territorial displays and to attract a mate, but it also likes the wide plant spacings uh, where it can forage on the ground and have cover uh, from predators and, and things like that. There is an incredible diversity of plants out here. And there's also an incredible arrangement of structure as well, which is important uh, to the different wildlife species. And we like to see this because it's beneficial to wildlife. The area we're in now has been burned on a three-year rotation. You could say that fire has been kept from this for three years. And as you can see, the difference is dramatic particularly notice the hardwoods that have encroached and have, have come up. Notice that there's not the herbaceous vegetation, there's not the grasses, there's not the flowering plants that we see, but it's dominated by, by hardwoods. 
As far as wildlife habitat, this is of much less benefit than the previous plots that we've been on. One of the things that's so amazing is that the forest can change so dramatically in such a short period of time if you keep fire out of it, making it unsuitable habitat for wildlife. We're in an unmanaged forest now, a forest that actually we have protected from fire for over 40 years. This looks like a typical forest that you'd see all across the southeast. We have millions of acres of unmanaged forest. And as you can see, the forest composition is changing. We're having certain kinds of trees that are dying out. For example, the pine trees. They can't deal with the competition from the hardwoods. The hardwoods are getting up uh, to the top level of the forest. And as habitat for wildlife, it has changed dramatically. We have lost over half the species that once occurred here, simply because we protected it from fire. At one time, we thought that that was a good thing, but it sets the stage if we have drought conditions for destructive wildfire, and then we'll lose the whole forest. Some hardwood forests are also fire dependent. They do not need fire as often as the southern pines, but fire is still essential to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. The use of prescribed fire can enhance timber growth, and forests managed with prescribed fire are less prone to destructive wildfire. All right, guys. Appreciate you coming out for the burn today. Here's a map for everyone. We'll go over this. So how is prescribed fire done? It's a team effort. They gather to come up with a plan. They determine things like size, location, acceptable weather parameters, and what the outcome should be. The unit we're burning is called the Sloan unit. It is a two-year rough. It's been two years since we burned it. We're gonna burn inside of the fire breaks. We've got a fire break on three sides. This is a dirt road, and that will be our fourth fire break on our unit. You know, the people that are doing the prescribed burns are professionals. They know what to do. They know how to do it. They know how to see how the fire's behaving. They know how to modify their techniques to, to keep things under control and to get the desired re uh, results that you're looking for out of that burn. We're gonna break into two groups. We're gonna have an ignition crew, which will be Caroline and Kevin. We're gonna have a holding crew, Jerome, Ron and Jason. So let's get our tools and get our stuff and let's head out to the unit. Our prescribed fire, uh, we say, is a safe way to apply this natural process, ensure ecosystem health, and most importantly, reduce the risk of destructive wildfires. When we go to actually implement a controlled burn, we have a plan, we follow that plan. That plan has parameters for weather conditions, smoke direction, relative humidity. We always ignite a test fire, which is a small fire to see if the fire indeed is doing what we expect it to do, if it's controllable, if it's gonna meet our objectives. And then during the actual burn, we continue to monitor the weather. We often have observers out on the highways checking if we're doing any sort of visibility reduction. We'll have people checking the humidity to be sure we're still in prescription. And we'll be monitoring the fire behavior itself to make sure that it's, it's within the parameters that we would like it to be to achieve the goals we've set out for that burn. So the tool I'm using uh, is called a drip torch. It's a typical tool we use when we do hand ignition. What I'm trying to do is find some uh, fuel like dead grass, the thatch at the bottom of these grasses, or some pine needles that will burn a little bit better. Once those heat up, this greener fuel, those will burn as well. You also kind of target areas that are, have bright sunlight on them. It's amazing how much better things in the sun burn than, than things under the shade. My ignition partner's taking the fire the other way and we'll talk to each other once I get to the end and probably do another strip. Well, the reason that we burn is mostly to kill or to top kill the hardwood vegetation that's right along the ground. If you don't top kill that with fire, then it ends up being the dominant plant and choking out all the herbaceous species and where most of the, most of the diversity is, most of the kinds of species are. And so what you end up getting is a hardwood forest instead of a pine forest. And also a lot of the animal species require 
uh, having this kind of open pine forest that's maintained by fire because once those herbaceous species that have their food and their cover and the things they need to survive start to disappear, the animals start to disappear with them. The, the thing that inconveniences the public the most is probably smoke. And, and we as fire managers, we have to, as we say, own our smoke. It's our smoke from the time we light the first match until the last smoldering snag is out. We plan with weather conditions and get our authorizations to burn based on dispersal of smoke going up and away. You want everyone to be safe. And so when you have a good day and your smoke goes where you want it to go and your burn is executed perfectly and you get done at the end of the day and you take a lap around the burn unit in your truck and it's beautiful black and a few things smoking, it's, it's, it's very satisfactory. And amazingly, within a short time, the black begins turning green again. In most plants in these fire-dependent habitats, re-sprout very quickly after they burn. So it's kind of like mowing the grass. When you cut the grass, you're not killing the grass. You're just knocking it back to the ground. And that's what fire mostly does in these habitats. It's like opening this incredible mystery book. And, and when you come in every day, you, you turn it to a new chapter and it's like, what am I gonna find out today? I love going out there right after burn and watching the progression of plants, watching the progression of wildlife. I know, okay, uh, it's like these are old friends and I know this one's gonna come up and I know this one's gonna come up. I know that's gonna provide the needs for this animal species or, or that, that songbird or for a small mammal or for a deer or whatever. That is so cool to watch. You'll see a plant sprout up that's been in the seed bank for 50 years that was finally released by fire. It had been waiting there, like a table mountain pine or something that you didn't even know was in the seed bank. You weren't sure you could ever recover that species on that site, and suddenly there it is. It's a landscape that we're at risk of losing if we exclude fire from it. Eventually, those, those seeds won't sprout, and we won't get those species back, and we won't have the wildlife species that are associated with those plant species. I'm always learning something. As you start to mature as a, as a burn practitioner, um, you learn about Bachman sparrows, you learn about red cockaded woodpeckers, all these different species that are fire dependent. I, I'm, I'm always learning about what they need um, from brood rearing standpoint to escape cover to nesting cover. And so it's just an ongoing learning process for me. I love my job. It, it, it gets me outdoors, it gets me out uh, in the woods where I'm more comfortable. Uh, and, uh, and, and I get to talk to people about the positive benefits of fire. I've been sold, now it's my challenge to sell you. This is a forced imbalance. Through science and research, we have learned fire here is as important to the ecosystem as sunshine, rain, and wind. With careful, thoughtful stewardship and working with nature to lessen man's impact, we will have a vast treasure for all to enjoy for generations to come.